five minutes, uh, seven o'clock. Are we live? Yes, we are live. Okay. So uh, welcome. It's seven o'clock on Wednesday, the 21st of October. And uh, a warm welcome to you all, whether you are viewing us through Zoom or indeed using uh, the internet, um, which of course our meeting is being held at East Hearts as a virtual meeting. And uh, if you're watching uh, on the internet, you'll either be watching on the East Hearts District YouTube channel, or if anybody uh, is not a councillor and not involved in the meeting and then wants to watch the rest of the meeting, you're welcome to do so. But the easiest way to do that is actually to go on the East Hearts Council website, then click on councillors and committees, and then a blue box will appear and you click on that blue box which says live meetings online. That, that might be simpler than uh, using the alternative East Hearts YouTube channel. So before we start our meeting, we welcome a Hertfordshire-based rabbi, Rabbi Aaron Goldstein, to speak to us for a few minutes. Thank you, Aaron, uh, for coming along this evening and uh, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. I don't know how many rabbis you've had uh, starting your meetings, but uh, I'm honoured to be with you this evening. Um, and uh, maybe it's a rabbi with a twist as well, because um, I represent liberal Judaism, uh, a branch of Judaism that uh, looks forward into the future and is rather progressive. Um, and at the same time, we look to our traditions as well. We, way back when, had our first rabbis were always known as pairs. Uh, and one pair in particular were Hillel and Shammai. And they were known to always argue over points of law. They were never in agreement. They were always opposite to each other. But they were also known to do so with respect for each other. And that whilst they disagreed, while they had different points of view and different backgrounds indeed, they were able to do so as our understanding is for the sake of heaven. And so they have a special place within our tradition when liberal Jews talk about God, we do so not using G-O-D because that has many connotations within our society. There's also the understanding within traditional religions that it's normally worded as Lord as well, which is a bit of a problem for a rabbi with two daughters and many women within our community. And so we speak of God rather as eternal one. And it is to that God which we all can actually think about not one with a god but one with an eternal one one that is always around us and one that we can define in our own ways not giving it one particular definition so eternal one of truth make us all honest in the quest for truth even when it goes against our favorite prejudices Make us brave in speaking it, even when it goes against the fashion of the day. But teach us also to respect the right of others, to seek the truth in their way, and to come to different conclusions. For they may be right and we may be wrong, or we may both be partly right and partly wrong. And when we disagree, may we disagree charitably in mutual respect and love. Let our controversies be like those of Hillel and Shammai for the sake of heaven. Let them be motivated only by the desire that your will may be understood and your purpose advanced. I hope all of your deliberations are like that of Hillel and Shammai. May you have wisdom. May you all seek truth. And may I also thank you for... Sometimes it is seen as a thankless task to take on public office, but I know that what you are doing is a sacred task. So thank you very much indeed. Rabbi Aaron Goldstein, thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. I do appreciate that, thank you. Now, I'm going to mention uh, about the, the voting, which many of you know anyway. Um, we, um, Normally, of course, take a show of hands. The technology, though, enables us to use the green tick if we're in favour of something, a red cross if we're against it, and we usually use the blue hand 
uh, if we're abstaining. Uh, as these indicators are only visible to the uh, attendees at this meeting, for the benefit of the public, I will then state whether the item is carried. If any members are participating by phone, they will need to speak to say how they're going to vote. So I think uh, Councillor James Frecknell is on the phone. Is that right, Councillor Frecknell, are you there? Yes, uh, Chairman, thank you very much for that. Right, just wanted to check that. And is there anybody else who is uh, on the phone tonight rather than via Zoom? No, nope, doesn't appear to be. Uh, regarding speaking, you'll know that uh, we ask you to raise the blue hand button to indicate uh, when you wish to speak. Um, and obviously for somebody like Councillor Frecknell tonight, he's got internet problems, that's why he's on the phone. Um, then, you know, you just need to call out James and uh, we'll, we'll get to you. Uh, <clears throat> now, as regards guests that are present, um, well, you can uh, click the leave button when you've, you know, finished your appearance, if I can use that uh, term. Uh, you can join us on uh, using the East Hearts website and going to councillors and committee and then the blue box. So you can watch us uh, live there. In terms of personal announcements, uh, I've been to St Albans Cathedral uh, on Sunday for the Mayor of St Albans Civic Service, uh, which any of you who have been to a church, a synagogue, a mosque, or any religious establishment recently will know how different it is uh, or different over the last few months because of the restrictions that are involved. St Albans is a big cathedral, so you can have sort of more people in there. They can at least uh, have a choir to sing because, of course, the congregation's not allowed to sing. You have to wear masks. So uh, it, it's not the same, but nonetheless, it did actually uh, go ahead. Um, right. We're going to mention a couple of people well, a few people actually, um, who've been recognised in this year's Queen's Birthday Honours. Uh, can I just check if Laura Higgins and Claire Ewins are here? Are you both here? Yes, Laura Higgins is here. Hello, Laura. Thank you for joining us. Thank you is, for the invite. Is Claire here? No, Claire. If anybody can let me know when, if Claire, when Claire arrives, uh, even if it's later on during the meeting. Um, then I'll, I'll just you know, mention her. Uh, and if she doesn't arrive, I'll mention her towards the end. But uh, Laura, um, Laura Higgins is from Bishop Stalford. She's the National Crime Agency's Head of Strategy and Portfolio within the Digital Data and Technology team. She has been awarded the MBE for her services in enabling the agency to maintain critical operational effectiveness during the COVID-19 pandemic. Her leadership, commitment and personal interventions directly ensure that over 3,500 officers were kept safe during lockdown, enabling effective remote working and assured support and sustainment to the agency's investigative capabilities and services. Laura has worked within investigations, HR, technology, and currently the data and technology team. Her law enforcement career has spanned HM Revenue and Customs, the National Crime Agency, and its precursors for over 25 years. But Laura, many, many congratulations to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. We're delighted. Uh, but would you have been, uh, because the Queen's Honours were later this year because of COVID, it would have been in June. Uh, did you know in June you have to keep it quiet? How, how did that work? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, I only found out a few weeks ago, so I only had to keep it quiet for a few weeks, and that was challenging enough, I have to say. Well, I know your quote, I've got a quote from you here, which says it's important uh, that this recognition isn't just for you personally, but the, the role of the NCA has in protecting the public. This year has been a challenge for every one of us, she says, and this award is an incredible bright spot in an otherwise difficult time. Having our agency's work and contribution to law enforcement recognised on this level 
is something for us all to be proud of. Uh, Laura Higgins, many, many congratulations to you. I'm sure if we were in the council chamber, we'd be giving a, a, a round of applause. Um, I noticed, James, did you put your hand up there? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to let you know that Claire Ewens is watching on YouTube, um, but she's not actually in the Zoom call. I've just seen that she's commented on the YouTube, on the YouTube stream. She says oh, that she can hear you, but she can't speak. She can hear us, but can't. Thank you very much. Sorry, I think as an update, the host has just messaged me that Claire may have joined now. Claire possibly might be present in this meeting rather than just on the live stream. Okay. Um, can we, if if she is there, Stephen, can you unmute Claire? I can hear you, but Hello. she can't speak. Oh, there you are, Claire. I can see you. Right. Thank you. All right. Just before we come to you, Claire, Laura, many congratulations and thank you very much. We're going to send um, a, a letter or a certificate to you uh, uh, from uh, East Hearts Council congratulating you on this award. And, and thank you very much indeed for spending a few minutes with us. Um, can we... Thank you. Thank you. Stephen, can you unmute Claire? I can hear you. But Hello. She can't oh, there you are, Claire. I can see you. Right. Thank you. All All right. Right. Just before we come to you, Claire, Laura, you are, Claire. congratulations. Thank you very thank much. You. much. We're going All to right. send Just before we come to you, Claire, Laura, Laura many congratulations. You. And thank you very much. We're going to send um, a good a delight to you. Uh, uh, from uh, East Hearts Council congratulating you on this award. And, and thank you very much indeed for spending a few minutes with us. Can we... Thank you. Thank you. Stephen, can you unmute Claire? I can hear you. But she can't oh, there you are, Claire. I can see you. Right. Thank you. All right. Just before we go. Right. Hopefully, we're technically, we're, we're, we're back as it were, and we'll carry on from there. So, um, Claire, uh, let me say just a few words about you, Claire, um, because you received the BEM for services to your rural community in Much Haddon. You initiated a wonderful project that has seen the village come together during the virus. You set up uh, a buddy system whereby residents have kept in contact with more isolated members of the community. And our own councillor, Ian Devonshire, he's budded with a 94-year-old lady for whom he does shopping and picks up medicines, post letters, and generally keeps an eye on her welfare. And the scheme has expanded into the surrounding areas, including Perry Green, Green Tye, and Hunston. Claire, uh, I'm told uh, from Ian Devonshire, has a great heart and puts 100% in. He says our village is better for her having her as a resident. Uh, Claire has also expanded her Sunday lunch club, which she's run for many years. People can turn up at the ball for lunch at no cost in a friendly atmosphere. It's been a really welcome option, especially for people who need a bit of company in these difficult times. And uh, Claire, I, th I think you wanted to say a few words. Congratulations to you anyway on uh, receiving the BEM. Would you like to? Um, yes, sir. That's really kind of you. Sorry, I was on your live stream rather than your Zoom, so I was waving at you. But um, it's really kind of you. I've never done a vote of thanks before, and I'm very humbled um, to have been singled out. It was our health centre manager, Andrew Wilkinson, and Much Haddon, who very kindly nominated me for this award. Um, but what I wanted to say was, it's actually thanks to a lot of you in East Hearts District Council. Um, you've been helping me join DOTS for 10 years. It was actually Linda Hazy who encouraged me 10 years ago to work with the children at Heathmount over at Watton and Stone to develop the, the program over there. I'd just been recently divorced. My two boys had gone to Heathmount to be around trees and sport. Um, and volunteering over there was a privilege, thanks to people like Linda being so encouraging. You must remember, being Northern Irish, I'm a bit out of my comfort zone in Middle England. So it's lovely when just kind people encourage people like myself. Um, I happened to be seated next to Colin Woodward about seven or eight years ago at a cancer lunch. And he said, why don't you bring your stepping stones over to Apton Road to help the senior citizens? Um, and it was also Colin that got me along to one of your health and well-being forums, I think five or six years ago, where I met a lady called Gail Staines, who now runs your Bishop's House, part of her team there. That got me into Dementia Friends. It got me involved with the Learners Library. So I see a real lovely circle, thanks to Linda, Colin, Gail. I can see George and Angela. You were great encouragers back when we were all trustees at Apton Road. Um, there's just been no end of help 
Mark Prisk, who lives in our village, encouraged me around the Care Bank project. And that, that's really how the Lunch Club got involved. People like Eric, Councillor Eric McCullough, you've been nothing but helpful with all the dementia friendliness work. Catherine Foy and Simon Marlowe, who you guys jointly fund with social prescribing. That's really been why I got this award for COVID and much had them because all those dots have been joining up for years, thanks to you guys. And I really feel I was just in the right place at the right time to, to be the catalyst um, for this award. Um, my dad in his 90s got an MBE for services in, in Northern Ireland all through the troubles. He was the chairman of the local cancer campaign and bless him, he's gone two years. And I think that's what really makes me feel quite choked that he would have been very proud. So I can't really thank you all enough. I mean, to bring you Brian up to date, Simon Barfoot has kindly allowed me to get involved in the Healthy <coughs> Hubs project to, to bring stepping stones. So back to Linda again and Dementia Friends, back to Colin, to, to the current picture. So. I'm hoping for the next few years, we can just keep carrying on joining up dots. And it really is thanks to East Hearts District Council. You're so open, so encouraging, so motivating. So what volunteer wouldn't want to be in this community? I really love working with you all and, and thank you for honouring me. I'm really pleased, thank you. Clay mm. Ewans, thank you very much indeed. Definitely we will give you a, a round of applause even though you might not be able to hear it, but thank you. Uh, at least you can see it. Thank you for very much for joining us and congratulations again. Um, I'd also, sorry? Chairman? Yes, Councillor Goldsby. Yes, so, thank you, Chairman. Could I add uh, many congratulations from the Liberal Democrat group to both Laura and Claire and to thank them very much for all that they do for our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Goldsby. I'm also going to mention uh, Tony Eastow and Marion Newman. They couldn't join us today. But Tony Eastow is a high-ranking police officer, also from Bishop Stortford, a specialist in command and control systems and processes, and a director of immigration enforcement at the Home Office. He's named a CBE for services to law and order. He's been a commander in London's Metropolitan Police Service since 2009, and before that as a chief superintendent, and was the borough commander for Barking and Dagenham for 21 months. He says he's Humble to receive this honour, I see it as a recognition of the crucial and often unseen work played by hardworking civil servants alongside our colleagues in law enforcement and the intelligence services and keeping the public and our country safe. It remains my absolute privilege to continue working with dedicated professionals across so many disciplines. So congratulations to Tony Eastow, who received the CBE, and Marion Newman received a BEM for services to the beauty industry during COVID-19. She lives in the village of Waterford. She was the founder of Marion Newman Nails, and she's been a major figurehead in the UK nail industry for over 30 years. She comes from a scientific background. She's always campaigned for the highest level of education and understanding in the industry. Her responses to the COVID-19 crisis was to set up a group on Facebook so nail professionals could come together sharing concerns and offering support to each other as the salon industry came to a halt. It fast became one of the main sources of factual information that nail professionals could access and rely on. So, Congratulations to her as well. And now we'll turn to our agenda for this evening. And Rebecca, do we have any apologies? Um, yes, we have apologies from Councillor Crystal. And um, may I also ask whether you would be um, happy, Chairman, to ask that all members show their video unless they have a transmission problem that prevents them from doing so or uh, on dial-in. Okay, I have passed that on. You probably heard what Rebecca said. If you could please show your video uh, during the course of the meeting, unless there's any particular technical reason or if, if you're on the phone, obviously. Um, should we do the roll call now, Rebecca? And if you could just call out present when Rebecca uh, calls out your name. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Yes. Uh, Councillor Alder. Councillor Alder, I believe Councillor Alder is present. I thought she was. Present. 
Thank you, Councillor Orga. Councillor Andrews. Present. Councillor Beckett. Present. Councillor Bell. Present. Councillor Bolton. Present. Councillor Boylan. Present. Councillor Brady. Present. Councillor Eric Buckmaster. Present. Councillor Ruth Buckmaster. Present. Possibly <laughs> feedback there. Um, Councillor Bull. It seems Councillor Bull is absent. Councillor Bermitz. Present. Councillor Core. Present. Uh, Councillor Crystal has get sent apologies. Councillor Curtis. Present. Councillor Crofton. Present. Councillor Cutting. Present. Councillor Deering. Present. Councillor Devonshire. Present. Councillor Drake. Present. Councillor Dumont. Present. Councillor Fernando. Present. Councillor Frecknell. Present. Councillor Goldspink. Present. Councillor Goodeve. Present. Councillor Hall. Present. Thank you. Councillor Hazy. Present. Councillor Holleborn. Present. Councillor Huggins. Present. Councillor Jones. Present. Councillor Kay is obviously here. Councillor Kemp. Present. Councillor McAndrew. Present. Councillor McMullen. Present. Councillor Newton. Uh, present. Councillor Page. Present. Councillor Pope. Present. Councillor Ranger. Present. Councillor Redfern. Present. Councillor Reed. Present. Councillor Rowley. Present. Councillor Ruffles. Present. Councillor Rutland Barsby. Present. Councillor Snowden. Present. Councillor Stevenson. Present. Councillor Stowe. Present. Councillor Simons. Councillor Simons. She was here present. before. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Ward Booth. Present. Councillor Williamson. Present. Councillor Wilson. Present. And Councillor Wiley. Present. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll now move to the minutes, uh, item number three on the agenda. That's on page uh, seven of your pack. And um, before we propose and second, are there any amendments to the minutes at all? And that's the minutes of the meeting held on the 22nd of July, 2020. No, okay. Uh, Councillor Jeff Jones. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, could I propose that we accept the minutes of the council meeting of the 22nd of July as a true record? Thank you for the proposal. And Councillor Rishi Fernando? Yeah, uh, would like to second uh, the, that proposal, please. Thank you. So if we can uh, vote on the minutes, accepting the minutes, uh, green tick for yes, red cross for no. Mm -hmm and the um, blue hand for abstentions. Chairman, it's a blue hand from me until I can sort out this laptop. Well, Mr. Chairman, same from me. I've got a, a, a finger, a thumb. <laughs> you mean you, you've not seen the minutes? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm just voting with you. I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm limited oh, to a wave. The thumb. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Terribly sorry. No, no, it's okay. Don't worry. <laughs> and um, Councillor Frecknell, you're okay with the minutes? 
Yes, thank you, Chair. Right, thank you very much. Okay, that's carried. Uh, so thank you very much. We shall now move on to item number four, declarations of interest. Do we have any declarations of interest at all? Raise a blue hand if there are, no, okay. Item number five, petitions, that there aren't any petitions. So we move now on to item number six, public questions. Um, Stephen, are our uh, guests in, in the meeting? So we're in the waiting room. Yes, I believe that the public speakers are now present. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, so we'll go with the first public question, and that's from Mr. Chris Ramsden. Mr. Ramsden, good evening to you, and can we have your question, please? Good evening. I hope you can hear me fine. Yes. The Council has been wise to re-examine the current business plans for the impact of COVID and Brexit. If I'm not mistaken, the capital budget over the next four years is 120 million, which is a considerable amount of money. And if borrowed at existing interest rates would lead to an annual finance charge of just under 6 million, which is roughly 40% council tax income. If any of these figures are wrong, I'm of course happy to be corrected. In the interests of prudent financial management and council tax payer buy-in, all business plans should be independently and objectively transparent reviewed by publishing as much information as possible so that interested council taxpayers are able to assess the position and that they are assured that the plans are robust to future changes, likely to achieve the benefits and plan returns, and that the risks of non-achievement are manageable. In my attempts to achieve some of this, my briefing investigations have encountered a number of issues, including entire documents being restricted and missing figures. In order for such a review to occur, all business plans currently being re-examined should be published. If there is a need to restrict any content, then they should be published in a way that minimise the restriction to sensitive data only. All published business plans should contain figures for the top line total revenue, a breakdown into components, the various deductions and the bottom line council contribution surplus subsidy. Various deductions include figures for direct costs, indirect costs, staff costs, financing costs and service costs for separate line items. The council taxpayer, as end customer, ultimate funder and risk taker, requires from the review assurances that there is a high confidence that the top and bottom line figures are achievable and that any risks of non-achievement are manageable. So, all assumptions are valid over a time period of at least the duration of the loans and that the plans are robust with respect to any future long-term COVID consequences and new trends, including possible changes to car parking needs, cinema going use, retail shopping habits, and East Hearts residents working at home, etc. So please will the council, one, publish the business plans as openly and transparently as possible, along the lines above, in a report to the council. Two, perform an independent, open and objective review that publishes as a report the answer to the question, what assurances can the council give that each of the business plans is viable and that, for example, an independent, hard-nosed business person would invest in such a project with their own money. Thank you, Mr. Ramsden. And Councillor Jeff Williamson, our Executive Member for Finance, would you care to reply? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Chairman. Um, good evening to you, Mr. Ramsden, and thank you for your question. Within your question, you say you're happy to be corrected if any of the figures you have given are wrong. So if I may, for the public record and to give context to my answer to you, I do feel it necessary to state the following. Firstly, the capital programme as agreed by the council in January is indeed 120 million as you have correctly stated. However, not all of this is being used on our major schemes. There is a range of other small and medium sized projects into which we are also making capital investments included within this number and not all involve bricks and mortar. Secondly, there is in fact no need for us to borrow anything close to this full amount as we are starting with considerable capital reserves. And furthermore, the business cases 
include the costs of any borrowing required and still meet the rate of return test. Thirdly, for such borrowing as may be needed, the interest rates on public sector borrowing sourced via the Public Works Loan Board are much less than the 5% you have been working with. Depending on the type and term of the loan, rates as of last Friday ranged from between 2.2 and 2.73%. Lastly, and, and this is really key, I should also make it clear that once the leisure centres are completed, the operator will move from requiring a subsidy to paying money to the council, making a major saving on the revenue account. Similarly, Hartford Theatre, once complete, moves from requiring a subsidy to returning a surplus. This means that rather than the schemes being a burden on our council taxpayers, the improved revenue position actually releases resources which can be used to support the delivery of other council services. However, the key driver behind these projects is not just the financial return, but they will, that we will be providing enhanced facilities for our residents. Due to these non-financial community values, there is therefore a key distinction between how a local authority views investing in its projects and the way a private a business person would, hard-nosed or otherwise. Nonetheless, it is quite right that the business cases for our major projects do undergo appropriate degrees of scrutiny and there are various levels of scrutiny that the council has in place. Various senior officers of the council are directly involved with these projects and keep a watching brief on viability as each project progresses. Particular among these is our head of strategic finance property who acts as what is known as our Section 151 officer, a post every authority is required to have by law and must be held by a qualified accountant. And he has responsibility for the proper administration of the council's financial affairs. In addition, he has a statutory responsibility to report in the public interest if the council is about to or has incurred unlawful expenditure or is setting an unbalanced budget. In terms of being tough and ruthless with costs, arguably local government finance officers, officers are particularly adept. They have assisted local authorities to survive the last decade of decreasing central government funding. And in this time, out of many hundreds, only one council has failed, requiring government intervention. There are also a number of council members here with considerable business acumen who look at and vote on the budget. Indeed, it was a call from members that led to the recent full reviews of the major project business cases to be undertaken, particularly in the light of this changing world as we are now living in, as you have alluded to. Therefore, you and the public can be assured that the budget and the major project business plans have been subject to a rigorous examination by the Section 151 officer and others using a range of scenarios and have proved robust. I can also assure you that the Section 151 officer continues to challenge colleagues and members on the expenditure and risks as is quite right and proper. The Section 151 officer has also informed me that our external auditors, Ernst and Young, will examine the business cases during the current year's audit to assess their value for money and their effects on the council's medium term financial plan. Following completion of the reviews, and I'm addressing my colleagues here too, in order to give all members a full briefing, the Chief Executive has arranged for members to be invited to an informal information session at which they will receive a presentation on each business case and members will have the opportunity to ask searching questions. Many members of the Council who are hard-nosed business people themselves will, no doubt, bring their skills to bear. However, um, in terms of any public or independent scrutiny that, as you have requested, I am advised by our Section 151 officer and our monitoring officer who safeguards the Council's legal position that the major projects business cases cannot be put in the public realm because they contain information that would prejudice current and future tendering for the works to be carried out. Quite simply, if these business cases were public knowledge, then bidders for contracts would know our budgets for construction and for contingencies and would then simply price uh, 
those uh, reflected in, in the in the in those budgets. To put in very formal terms, the information is exempt from publication under paragraph eight of part one of schedule 12A of the Local Government Act of 1972, as it contains the amount of any expenditure proposed to be incurred by the authority under any particular contract for the acquisition of property or the supply of goods or services. So whilst I cannot place these business cases into the public domain, I hope that the measures I have outlined reassure you and other council taxpayers of East Hertfordshire that the business cases have been subject to full governance and democratic scrutiny and will continue to be so. Thank you very much, Councillor Williamson. Mr. Ramson, do you have a supplementary question? Um, yes, um, I'm extremely, um, I don't find your answer very reassuring at all. And I'm extremely surprised that you can't publish more than what you've published already. Um, so I, I have to ask you again, um, will you look at your business cases more thoroughly and work out what can be published and what can't? In terms of costs for um, work done, once you've, once you've, what, what, what work is going to be done, once you've agreed that some, with a, with, once the tender's agreed, then I'd have, or even before then, I would have thought that you could at least publish more about the um, returns that you expect. Let me give you an example. Well, no, can, we, we, it's a supplementary question. I mean, yeah, I think you've, al you've asked the supplementary question. So we, we can't have another statement. That was in your first question, as it were. So I have to take the question that you asked uh, a moment or two ago to be your supplementary question, Mr. Ramsden. So Councillor Williamson, do you want to comment on being able to, to publish uh, more information as Mr. Ramsden suggested? I can only go by the advice I've been given by our Section 151 officer and uh, our monitoring officer that at this time, uh, we are unable to publish any further information than we already have. Um, at such time as the re reviews or the business cases no longer have information which is deemed to be sensitive, which will be further down the line, then it is possible that those reviews could be published, but not until such time. Councillor Williamson, thank you very much. Mr. Ramson, thank you for your question. Can I ask you for our next uh, question now, is a representative of the Bishop Stortford Climate Change Group, and that's Yvonne Estop. Yvonne, can we have your question, please? Yvonne, are you there at all? Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank That's you. fine. Go ahead. The Bishop Stortford Climate Group is very concerned that the government's planning white paper seriously threatens your own policy making role as local planning authority and that it gives unconstrained freedoms to developers. Can you please let us know what representations you have made? to the government challenging the white paper. Thank you very much. Councillor Jan Goodeve, the executive member for planning and growth will respond to that one. Councilor. Thank you, Chairman. The council will be submitting a detailed response to the planning white paper. The draft response is currently being considered by the non-key decision route and is available to view on the council's website. The council's final response will also be available to a view on the council's website in due course. Do you have a, a supplementary question, uh, Yvonne? Thank you, Councillor Goody, for your answer. And, and I'm glad that the council is going to make representations. I, I would just ask that, um, would you undertake to vigorously pursue this as the white paper progresses uh, to continue to in interrogate it, to make sure that local planning authority powers are protected and to make sure that the planning white paper remains consistent with the environment bill, which it is sort of rather paying scant regard to at the moment. 
Thank you. Councillor Goodeve, do you want to respond to that? Um, all, all I can do at the current moment is, is uh, direct you to the website where you can have a look at the draft. Um, we do have a number of significant concerns, and I think if you have a good look, um, hopefully you'll, you'll feel satisfied. But the public are also able to comment on the white paper in their own right also. Thank you, Councillor. Good Eve. Yvonne S. Dot, many thanks indeed uh, for joining us with your question. Uh, Martin Adams has a question. He's from Much Haddon. Mr. Adams, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, councillors. Um, I consider that the uh, published policies map being presented later today is inaccurate because a part of it was not part of the normal plan adoption process. I'm referring to a part of it, uh, a change to the village boundary at Miller's View and Mill Cottages in Machadam. My research indicates that it was not consulted upon or ever presented to council for adoption. I believe it was added afterwards entirely as a staff initiative. I understand that you've got copies of two letters that are recently sent to Mr. Cassidy. As per these two letters, I consider this is a significant change and that it has not been handled in a democratic fashion. I've repeatedly put forward questions about this change to the council that have never been answered as outlined in my second letter to Mr. Cassidy. I would request that this boundary change is withdrawn because it's drafted after the plan was adopted. Failing that, I would like to see the matter opened up for proper consultation so that my unanswered questions, as per my second letter, can be considered alongside comments from other parties. Staff have always, been, have always dealt with my queries politely and respectfully, but I believe their overall response has been to say, we're very sorry it happened this way, but we won't consider changing it. I think this response is unreasonable. I would ask council to support my request to make uh, remove this change from the map. This would ensure fairness, consistency of decision making, and ensure proper consultation of planning decisions. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Adams. I'm going to ask Councillor Linda Hazy, the leader of the council, to respond on this one. Um, thank you, Mr. Adams, for your um, question. Um, now, just to clarify, Mr. Adams' request does not directly relate to the material within the council report before members tonight. This report seeks to make three factual amendments to policy CFLR1 on the policy map in Perry Green and Green Tie. Mr. Adams' request relates to a concern about the Much Haddon village boundary and how the materiality of the boundary could impact upon a planning application at Miller's View in Much Haddon, which has been refused and is currently at appeal. Mr. Adams refers to a change that was made to the Much Haddon village boundary following the district plan examination. And Mr. Adams is concerned that the change was made without consultation and does not reflect the build up, built up area of Much Haddon. Officers have previously advised a number of times to you, Mr. Adams, um, that um, the area in question was incorporated into the village boundary to be consistent with policy VILL1, which notes that village development boundaries are drawn around the main built up area of the village. As such, the change made to the village boundary at Much Haddam um, was um, covered and incorporated during the examination period. Once built out, this development would clearly form part of the main built up area of the village and its inclusion ensured that the policies map was consistent with policy VILL1. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hazy. Uh, Mr. Adams, do you have a supplementary question at all? I do. Um, I've asked many times, um, there are inconsistencies in the changes to the village boundaries. I've asked many times, why is one place in Much Haddam that, that is more obvious not being changed? But for instance, where I live, that's been adjacent to the village boundary for 60 years, 
has all of a sudden become included to the included in the village boundary. So basically, I'm complaining that these changes are completely inconsistent, and I've never had a proper response to that. And so that is why I think it's unfair. This question has been avoided for six months. I'm, I'm sorry, to, I'm getting a bit angry. I'm sorry, Councillor Heisey. I think most of you, what you said was absolutely fine. It was a very good summary of the situation, but I still think the change is completely illogical, bearing in mind the situation on the ground and other places in Much Adam that have not been included in the village boundary. Okay, thank you, thank you Mr. Adams. Was there a question in there? There was. Um, why do you think that our house that has been next to the village boundary for 60 years should be suddenly included in the village boundary, whereas the other examples I have given you that are much more obvious to my mind that should be in the village boundary have never have not been included at this time? Okay, I think um, if I may, Chairman, um, respond to that. I think this is not totally relevant to the original question that you put forward, which was about the um, maps, which are coming to council later on as a paper. And I think your um, discussions very much relate to how the village boundaries were determined, the, the effect of the inspector when he went, she went through those boundaries, um, and it's a planning matter and not necessarily something for full council to uh, consider. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hayes. And thank you, Mr. Adams, for coming along. Thank you, and thank you for your time. Questions. Thank you. And now we go to item number seven, and that's uh, members' questions. Now we have eight questions submitted. And I remind members that both questioner and the responding executive member must try and ensure that the question and the reply is succinct. And the total time allowed for consideration of any questions submitted should be around 15 minutes. Now, given the fact that we now publish the full responses the day after this meeting, uh, short verbal responses really are to be encouraged so that we can really keep to a time limit. Any remaining questions not dealt with in this time will be responded to in writing before the next ordinary meeting of the council and all responses will be published on the website as soon as possible after this meeting. So we're going to take the questions in order they're submitted and the first question is from Councillor Peter Ruffles. Peter. Thank you Chairman. As you, you know Chairman, a number of other agencies have worked with the lead players, the highways at the county, trying to ensure that our high streets and shopping centres were able to reopen safely. Would the executive member for wellbeing please explain the role of our East Hearts environmental health team and describe any particular difficulties and challenges they may have faced? Thank you, Councillor Ruffles. Councillor Eric Buckmaster to respond, please. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for, to Councillor Ruffles for the question. Um, so I'll answer in this way. The environmental health team has been playing a proactive role supporting local businesses throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. This has included contacting more than 400 local businesses to give detailed and bespoke advice in undertaking advisory visits or phoning or writing to businesses to share information about how to operate safely with regards to both staff and customers alike. This is the key way in which the council has sought to ensure business owners and managers are up to date on the latest regulations. Environmental health officers have been conducting a significant amount of their duties outside of the council's normal office hours so as to naturally reach the businesses when they're operating. This is a particular case with cafes, restaurants and pubs. When the 10 p.m. closing time was recently introduced, the team conducted 42 joint visits with the police to local businesses operating in the nighttime economy on a single Saturday night. To date, the team have followed up 557 individual reports from the public, from members, the police and others about businesses appearing to not be following the guidance properly. The team stance, whether in response to a report or during a proactive visit, is supportive rather than punitive, with the 4Es approach being adopted to ensure compliance for everyone's safety. Uh, and that is engagement, explanation, encouragement, and then finally enforcement, although to date, this latter approach has not been necessary. 
Support to help local businesses stay afloat at this challenging time has also included the licensing team speedily setting up a process to license tables and chairs on the pavement and being able to serve customers outside, of course, can overcome some of the restrictions applicable indoors. Any premises that sell food or drink for consumption, either on or off the premises may apply. This is a temporary measure which acts as an alternative to pavement licenses that the County Council has the power to issue. These are time limited and the fee is less than a third of the cost of a license issued by the County Council. Um, to date, the council has issued just two pavement licenses in Hartford and one in Bishop Stortford. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Buckmaster. Councillor Raffles, do you have a supplementary? I'm very grateful for that answer. I'm glad my question has been able to throw a little spotlight on the work of a very small team within East Hearts. But could I ask as a supplementary about the work that they've done to do with test and trace? Because I believe that is also... Uh, been quite an important part of their role. Yes, of course, of course Councillor Ruffles, thank you. Um, so it's worth noting on top of this work, since the beginning of October, environmental health officers have also been involved with the local test and trace system. So if neither the National Service nor the County Council can contact someone known to have been in close contact with a person with the virus, the environmental health team will pick up the case and try to find a phone number or even knock on people's doors if that's what it takes. And since the beginning of October, the team has worked on 44 such cases. The level of the workload and the fast pace with which the new national guidance is issued is challenging. Um, this is continuing with much fresh information needing to be communicated to businesses and the public alike and the small team of officers have worked collaboratively across the county and have reprioritized their work, often at short notice. Uh, so I'm very grateful for all the work they're doing. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Ruffles. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. That's interesting. Uh, on to Councillor Alistair Ward Booth for your question, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, prior to the coronavirus pandemic, the Council's social prescribing service was referring many hundreds of residents to local community activities um, and it was doing a very very worthwhile and award-winning job. Um, could the executive member for well-being give council an update regarding how and to what extent this service has been able to operate during the last six to seven months where we've had the lockdown and the associated restrictions? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ward Booth. Councillor Buckmaster. Thank you, Chairman. And, and again, thank you to Councillor Ward Booth for the question. Uh, yes, I'm happy to report that East Hart's social prescribing service has continued to operate throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, providing support over the phone. The number of clients referred to the service during April and May was lower than previously, but it's since steadily returned to pre-COVID levels. In 2019, 254 clients were supported through this service and 122 so far this year. And during lockdown, uh, more than 500 residents who had used the service previously were contacted as a part of the welfare checks. Telephone support to new and existing clients has been very well received. Many of them are particularly vulnerable to COVID due to age or existing conditions. So the social prescribing service will continue to support them over the phone until further guidance suggests it's safe to return to face-to-face -face support. To date, East Hart's social prescribing service has used council resources and Hertfordshire County Council funds to focus efforts on the Stork Valley area in the east of the district. However, we are currently looking at how to roll out the service more widely and or combine its work with the county-wide community navigators and other similar, similar services provided directly by the County Council and the local NHS Clinical Commissioning Group. A further development of social prescribing is Healthy Hubs, and this was launched using funding from County Public Health before lockdown as two physical locations to support people with advice and healthy lifestyle choices but unfortunately, 
this could no longer be held in that way. However, I am pleased to say that this month we've been able to start again, but this time virtually or online with a number of partners to help people with their physical and mental well-being. Thank you. Councillor Ward Booth, do you have a supplementary? Thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you to Councillor Buckmaster for, the, for that comprehensive answer. Um, I was interested to hear what he said about the Healthy Hubs initiative and wondered if he could tell us briefly a, a bit more about that and how that's been able to operate virtually. Uh, yes, of course, happy to do so. Um, in East Hearts, this funding is being used for publicity materials and resources for participating partners to provide advice and support sessions um, as with the existing social prescribing service to act as a referral and sign posting route. The original plan was for partner organisations such as Mind in Mid Hearts, East Hearts Citizens Advice and East Hearts CCG among others to run one-to-one -one and group sessions at Wallfields with a satellite office in Bishop Stortford. As mentioned, work has now been undertaken to move the Healthy Hubs to a virtual platform. In September, the Healthy Hub was completed, completely relaunched, offering more than 25 virtual sessions a month starting on, in October. And this included sessions covering mental well-being, healthy eating, coping with cancer, support through bereavement and becoming a dementia friend. The Healthy Hub activities are being promoted via our social prescribing scheme, the council's social media, and by the partners delivering the sessions. Uptake for the first sessions has been modest with only a handful of people signing up. However, this is to be expected given the switch in format. Officers are confident that participation will grow as the scheme becomes more established. A rolling program of virtual ses sessions which are free to access will continue to be delivered every month until face-to-face -face sessions are able to resume. Finally, I must offer my deepest thanks, not only to our staff who have worked so hard, but also to our members who've de demonstrated great resilience, and of course, our parishes and community that have stepped up to support vulnerable residents across the district. And we heard earlier from, uh, from Laura and Claire, and we're very proud of what they and others are doing. And I know from conversations I've had recently that many, such as the Bishop Stortford Operation community, are beginning to gear up again should the need arise. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor David Andrews. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you so much. I'd like to ask the leader, if I may, with your blessing, Chairman, what steps uh, this council is taking to lobby central government for additional funding uh, for local authorities such as East Hearts uh, that we might help contribute towards the financial difficulties faced by the impact of the coronavirus pandemic? Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Councillor Hazy. Um, thank you, Councillor Andrews, for your question. Um, let me first of all say that up to the 15th of October, the government had already paid 43.8 million to East Hearts Council. And there's a further 9.2 million, but that has not yet been received. Now, if I can just broadly go through where the money has, uh, why we were given it. Um, the money already received is made up of 41 million for East Hearts businesses, business rate relief, government grants to businesses, discretionary business grant money, and support for Bishop Stortford bid. 0.9 million for increased local council tax support claims, increased housing benefit claims, and money for discretionary accommodation for rough sleepers. And 1.8 million in grant to compensate the council for lost income and also for new burdens. The money to be received is made up of 8.7 million for business weight relief, uh, 192,000 for increased housing benefit, 92,000 for test and trace, 49,000 for COVID marshals, and again that will be an additional burden for the council, and 71,000 um, for discretionary accommodation for rough sleepers. Now, the government's scheme to compensate councils for the loss of income from sales fees and charges 
requires the council to absorb the first 5% loss fully, after which the government um, compensates us for 75 pence for every one loss. I think it's important to note that we are, uh, a lot of the monies we have received obviously have come uh, to compensate us for lost income. However, a lot of it is there to ensure that we are able to provide the additional work um, that actually the government is requiring of us. These uh, figures will be put and additional figures will be available on the website as of tomorrow and a much more detailed breakdown will be seen. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Andrews, a supplementary question. If I may, Chairman, um, uh, that, that's a very comprehensive answer and I thank the leader for it. Uh, we're all uh, better, far better informed and we look forward to uh, being able to check the figures on the website. In the meantime, might I ask uh, the leader what networks and opportunities she's been able to use to uh, get messages over to government about the financial burdens that we are facing? Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Andrews, for that. Yes, I think it's very important that we all recognise that everyone in local authorities have worked very hard in um, very clearly saying to central government uh, the requirement for additional funding. So the leaders of uh, East Hart of um, the uh, Hertfordshire County Council, right from the beginning of October, back into the beginning of March, met once a week. We now meet once a fortnight. We have ministerial um, um, conversations with the Secretary of State and his ministers normally once a fortnight. And so it has the LGA, the Local Government Association, has been very strong in lobbying the re requirements that local government have to have to ensure that we have financial stability um, and able to do our jobs, which actually the local authorities have done exceptionally well. Um, as you know, David Williams, who's the leader of the County Council, is the chairman of the County Council Network, so she, he has very close contacts with ministers. I am the chair of the East of England LGA, so again, we are working on a regional basis, and I think it's fair to say that we are making sure that government is very, very clear what we need to carry on as high quality local authorities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Myoni Goldspink, your question, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the first part of my question has already mostly been answered. Um, I'd just like to express my disappointment um, along with the public questioner. My disappointment is not possible to publish these reports, even if they are redacted. So I'm very disappointed about that. Um, so I'd like, if, if I may, to move straight to my supplementary um, questions. Um, the first part is, when will these uh, business viability reports and business cases be published? And when will we have the briefing which um, the executive are planning to arrange for us all so that at least councillors will be able to see the business cases? So uh, when will these reports be published? And when will the councillors have this briefing meeting? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Goldspink. Councillor Jeff Williamson, would you like to respond to that? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councillor Goldspink. Um, I understand that the member briefing is being arranged for next month. Uh, I, on top of my head, I believe the date is something like the 11th, but that is that, that needs to be confirmed. Um, in terms of when the reports can be published, well, that does rather go back to the answer I gave to, to Mr. Rams, Ramsden. Um, only at such time as any information which is in there, which is currently sensitive, um, is no longer sensitive. In other words, when all uh, contracts um, relating to the construction of the project have been placed. Um, so in order to give a time scale, that, that's very, very difficult, I'm afraid. As you've asked your supplementary, Councillor Goldspink, do you want to move on to your next question or do you want to ask another supplementary? You're muted at the moment, Councillor. Sorry. Oh. Yes. Uh, well, I just wondered, will members see these business reports before the date of, of the briefing or do we have, have to wait actually for the evening of the briefing? I'm, 
Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I may have to get some advice from, from the team, but uh, I can certainly follow up with a written response. Okay. Thank you. And Councillor Goldsmith, do you have another question? Oh, yes. Um, thank you very much, Chairman. Yes. Um, my second question is, um, why did the leader and the executive member for planning and growth decide to take a non-key decision on this council's response to the consultation on the government's white paper on changes to the planning system? Why did they decide to do it that way rather than bringing it to full council for open public discussion? I think this is a question for the leader of the council, Linda Hazy, or is it for Jan Goody? Um, Councillor Goody will answer yeah. this, please, Chairman. Oh, okay. yeah, I'm going to take that one. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it was not possible to draft the response in time to meet the committee cycle deadlines for reporting to full council. This is an approach has been followed in the past where there has been government consultations and the timescales haven't completely fitted with the committee cycle deadlines. The council's proposed response is, however, available for the public to view on the council's website. Also, we also organised a members briefing which was held on the 15th of October to ensure that members were briefed on the Council's draft response and have had the opportunity to ask questions. It should also be noted that the consultation is open to everyone to respond to and that the Government is keen to hear from a wide range of interested parties from across the public and private sectors, as well as from the general public. Thank you. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor Goldsby? Um, yes, please. Yes. Well, I hear everything that you are saying, but um, the draft responses were produced, they were available over a week ago, and uh, members did have a chance to see them, and yes, and we have had a chance to make comments, and I'm very grateful for that. But why could that report, that draft as it was, why could that not have come directly to full council tonight? And then we would all have had a chance to debate it. And then this would be, have been much more in the public domain. At the moment, members of the public have no idea what we're doing. Uh, but since we all do pretty much agree there are serious flaws in what the government is proposing, would it not have been nice for us to be able to demonstrate to the residents of East Hearts, demonstrate to them that we are responding vigorously to the government's um, proposals um, and that we're doing as, as much as we can. We had an opportunity tonight, because this is a public meeting, to demonstrate to the residents that we are uh, robustly responding to the government. And this was a good opportunity. Um, do not share my disappointment that we have lost that opportunity by reason of the fact that this has been done sort of um, away from the public gaze by the non-key decision. So do you share my disappointment um, that we've missed this opportunity? Councillor Goody? Oh. <laughs> no, and quite frankly, it's something that has garnered a great deal of, of public attention, um, including from the sort of various professional bodies that um, work within the planning system. Um, we had a member of, of the public here this evening asking a question. The document is available on our website. Um, it's, it's still available for comment. It doesn't get submitted until later this month, which is obviously after the date of this council meeting. All right, thank you for that. Uh, last question now will have to be from Councillor Louis Corr. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Um, I would like to ask my question to uh, the Executive Member for Environmental Sustainability. And hang on, let me just get the question up again. Um, so in February this year, uh, the Executive received a recommendation from the Task and Finish Group on Parking, which was ably chaired by Councillor Drake. And one of its recommendations uh, was regarding residents' parking zones um, and changing the, the threshold for eligibility. And this would alleviate many parking issues which are faced by residents in our wards. And I can personally say that in, B in Bishop Stortford All Saints, this is certainly something that uh, residents have been asking about. 
The executive asked the officers to bring a further report uh, setting out custom applications. And if I remember correctly from that meeting, uh, it was informally said this was take some six to eight weeks to produce, but we are now eight months down the line and I haven't seen any update on this issue come forward. Naturally, I understand that the pandemic has changed priorities somewhat. And uh, it's also true, however, that uh, parking challenges have been exacerbated, in particular, the kind of back to school run when fewer people are um, you know, comfortable with public transport has uh, caused issues for our residents. So can the executive member please comment on when we might hear back about uh, these recommendations and whether the council is uh, considering changing this RPZ eligibility policy. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Corp. Councillor Graham McClatchett. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, may I thank Councillor Corp for the advance warning of the question. <clears throat> Officers have been extremely busy responding to the impact of COVID-19. However, an update report will be presented at the executive meeting on the 24th of November. 2020, as stated in the February meeting. The recommendations will be presented in the context of financial impact, which has changed significantly since the beginning of the year. Receiving the report in November will be timely in the light of the medium term financial plan and preparing for next year's budget. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor McAndrew. Councillor Court. Thank you. Um, yes, one supplementary, please. And this is the report made a number of recommendations, and some of them I think were more uh, costly than others, and some would be cheaper to implement than others. And mm. my judgment would be that changing changing the eligibility for restricting uh, for residents parking zones would not be among the highest uh, costing ones. Um, would the executive member be able to uh, reassure me that? Um, not all the, the, the recommendations will be looked at um, together and the individual ones might still be adopted rather than uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Nothing's actually been ruled out at this time and moment, uh, Councillor Cole, so we'll sort of move forward once we get the paper, yeah? Thank you very much for your responses and apologies to the other questioners that we couldn't get to, but they will be responded to in writing uh, and published on the website as soon as possible after this meeting, uh, I would imagine uh, this week. We now go to item number eight, which is the executive report. It's the relates to the meeting of the executive on the 1st of September. Can I invite the leader of the council to present her report? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, seems a long time ago now, the 21st of October. Um, a lot is happening at the moment and it's happening very fast. And we're all having to respond to the changes in the COVID um, R number in a very rapid way. I think I'd like to again express my congratulations to uh, Laura and Claire, whom we heard speak to today, but also all four of our residents who um, received honours in the Queen's Birthday list. Um, they are a credit to our society, and I think that's one thing that uh, has been demonstrated in East Hearts, that actually we have an extraordinary um, uh, mem members of the residents who actually really see this as, as their community, and they have done exceptional work um, for looking after the vulnerable. So I think um, um, the council papers, there is one uh, recommendation uh, which needs to be approved by council um, and that is the updated safeguarding policy uh, is re recommended to council for adoption and that is on page 50, Chairman. Thank you. They are, otherwise they are all resolved items. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Peter Boylan. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Leader. I'm very pleased to present to Council this evening this updated safeguarding policy. Over the last few months, I've worked with officers through the safeguarding policy group to ensure the Council revised the previous version of this policy to reflect changes in national guidance. This version also includes a new section on the management of the IPs, as well as a more detailed section on safer recruitment. 
The draft policy was presented to and supported by the executive on the 1st of September with no further amendments. And I would therefore like to propose that the council adopt this updated safeguarding policy tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Alex Curtis. I'm happy to propose what's been said there. To, to second it. Sorry, seconded rather, yes, sorry. Yeah. No, thank you very much. And uh, any comments or questions, raise your blue hand, please, in participants. Councillor Goldstein. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, the Liberal Democrat group is happy to support these proposals. I think We think the policy is very good, very comprehensive and an excellent policy. So we're very happy to support it. Thank you. And that's on page 50 of the agenda that the draft update safeguarding policy be recommended to council for adoption. Uh, please uh, use the green tick if you're in favor, the red cross if you're against. Thank you very much. Uh, that is carried. Councillor Frecknell, you in favour? Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. And um, Councillor Hall and Burmitz, I don't know if you're still unable to vote technically, so are you in favour? It oh, looks like there's a tick anyway, so yeah, no. Thank you, that's carried. Right, we'll now move on to item number nine and the um, executive report on the 6th of October. Councillor Linda Hazel. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, again, um, all items are um, agreed at executive, but there are four items which do need to be approved by council. Um, <clears throat> the first one of which is the um, uh, the amendments to Appendix B, um, as noted and approved to form part of the adopted East Hearts District Plan 2018 policy maps. Uh, we, in fact, did cover this uh, with um, the question that came through to me uh, as one of the public questions. So I'm happy to propose this as the map is just recommendations to make sure that the inaccuracies are actually rectified. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ian Devonshire. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Leader. Um, these amended areas all fall within my ward. They're in green, so I'm very green. And so, therefore, I'd like to propose this recommendation to support these amendments to the policies map. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Devonshire. Councillor Jan Goody. Jan, are you seconding? I'm, I'm sorry, Chairman. Yes, I am seconding. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, any comments, questions? Councillor Goldsping? Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, the Liberal Democrat group is very happy to support this proposal, this recommendation about the maps. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Um, so the recommendation is detailed on page 90, that the amendments at Appendix B be noted and approved to form part of the adopted East Hearts District Plan 2018 policies map. Uh, if you could vote now, please, using the green tick or the red cross. Councillor Frecknell, are you in favour? Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. And that's carried. Thank you very much indeed. And that takes us to 9B, uh, and that is policies for enforcing standards for private sector landlords. Um, this is being, I believe, uh, being proposed by Councillor Boylan. Councillor Boylan. Thank you, Chairman. The Housing and Planning Act 2016 introduced measures to help councils to tackle poor quality private landlords and drive up standards in the private housing sector. It may come as a surprise to many of us that the private rented housing market makes up for almost half 
of all rented accommodation in East Hertfordshire and can be found in every town and village across the district. Tonight, I'm asking this council to adopt this series of four policies which will help to drive up the standards of the private rented housing market across this district. These four policies are being developed with other authorities across Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire to ensure the approach and civil penalties are applied in a consistent manner. The policies are being subject to public consultation and were presented to the Overview and Scrutiny Committee on the 15th of September, following which some helpful amendments have been made to the policies before being presented to the Executive on the 5th of October, who also extended their support to adopting these policies. I would therefore propose that Council adopt these four policies before you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Boylan. Councillor Norma Simons. Yeah, I'm absolutely thrilled to second, uh, to second this, the policies on additional housing standards. It's been a long time coming and I just, it's fantastic. So happy to second it. Thank you, Councillor Simons. Councillor Goldsping. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, the Liberal Democrat group is happy to support this policy. It's very comprehensive and very good. And I'm sure it will um, benefit and, and uh, all the tenants enormously. There's just one little extra thing, which I wondered if it'd be possible to put a little footnote. Um, under the banning orders, if um, landlords are, are prevented from continuing as landlords, I do have a little worry about what happens to the tenants. And I know this can't be part of the policy, but I just wondered, could there be a footnote um, asking that the council is alert to the possible effects of tenants if they're on tenants if the landlords are banned from continuing as tenants i don't know if it's possible just to put that as a little footnote um but otherwise we're very very happy with the policy and happy to support it thank you thank you councillor goldspink councillor caroline redfern yes i'd just like to add my comment that I support this, it's, um, I'm surprised it hasn't been put in place earlier actually, but I'm very pleased about it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Redfern. Councillor Boylan, did you want to come back on the comment Councillor Goldspink raised? Um, yes, certainly, Chairman. I, I'm not sure it it's, uh, requires a footnote to the policy. I take Councillor Goldspink's point um, and, and I would expect that issue to be taken into account, whether that was private rented or, or I think we, we, we're all, and officers are certainly are very sensitive to um, the situation that tenants sometimes find themselves in, whether that's with a private landlord or whether that's with a housing association. So I, I, I'm, I, I take the point. Thank you very much indeed. So the recommendation that we're voting on is on page 91. And if you're in favour, can you please use the green tick? Councillor Redfern, are you happy with that? I'm not Councillor Redfern, sorry, Councillor uh, Frecknell. Apologies. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Just to remind people, Councillor Frecknell's on the phone, so he can't do the voting as the rest of us can. Thank you very much indeed, that's carried. We move on to 9C, Council Tax Reduction Scheme 2021-22, uh, the third item from the executive. It's been uh, being presented and I believe Councillor Jeff Williamson is going to propose the recommendation. Uh, yes, indeed, thank you, Chairman. Uh, well, at its recent meeting, the executive considered the review of our Council Tax Reduction Scheme as we do every year. On the basis, there is no compelling reason to amend the scheme, which we've been running now unchanged since 2013. Uh, the executive is making recommendations to council as captured in recommendation A on page 91 to continue with the current scheme for a further year. And I'm pleased to move the recommendation, please, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Williamson. Councillor Ian Kemp. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm very happy to second the recommendation to continue this scheme. It's good to see that this council scheme that helps our most financially vulnerable citizens 
um, is continuing as it has done for many years. Thank you, Councillor Goldsping. Thank you, Chairman. The Liberal Democrat group is very happy to support this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. The recommendation is on the bottom of page 91 to continue the current local council tax support scheme for 2021-22. And if you could please vote and use the green tick or the red cross. Councillor Frecknell, you in favour? Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. And that too is carried. Thank you very much indeed. On to 9D, uh, the use of compulsory purchase powers, CPO, in the Gilston area. The uh, fourth item for tonight from the executive, use of compulsory purchase powers in the Gilston area has been uh, presented. And uh, I think Councillor Linda Hazy is going to propose the recommendation. Yes, thank you very much. Um, this is in anticipation of um, putting in CPO uh, requirements for some land which would enable the second crossing of the river stalk to go ahead. Um, we know that the um, developers are in close negotiation with the land owners uh, because this land is essential to ensure that we are able to uh, build our 10,000 homes which are required within the area. Um, this will not be implemented unless the developer cannot reach a mutual agreement with the landowners. So um, there were there were quite a lot of figures in this, which were in the uh, part two, pink papers at the executive, um, which again uh, formed part of that decision making process, but which are not essential for uh, approval by council. Thank you, Councillor Eric Buckmaster. Uh, yes, I'll second that, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. Any other comments or questions, Councillor Goldspin? Thank you, Chairman. The Liberal Democrat group is happy to support this proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's on page uh, 92. It takes up about half the page, so I won't read it, uh, but it's there. And if you're in favour, please vote. Use the green tick or the red cross. Councillor Frecknell, in favour? Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. And that's carried. Thank you very much indeed. On now to item number 10, the appointment of Section 151 Officer and Chief Financial Officer. I'm going to invite the Chief Executive of East Arts Council to present this report, Richard Cassidy. Thank you, Chairman. This is uh, agenda item 10 on page 141. Um, as members will be aware, Council appointed Bob Palmer as the interim Section 151 Officer at the start of the year following the departure of Isabel Britton. After a competitive recruitment process, I have now appointed a permanent head of strategic finance and section 151 officer, and Stephen Linnett took up this role at the end of September. The council is required to appoint a section 151 officer. Therefore, this report recommends that the appointment of Stephen Linnett as the council's chief finance officer and section 151 officer be approved by council. Thank you, Richard. Councillor David Andrews. Chairman, would you permit me to propose the recommendation for this item? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rosemary Bolton. I would like to second this and I'm delighted that Mr Linnett is on board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? Councillor Goldstein. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, the Liberal Democrat group is very happy to support this appointment. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, if you could just vote in the normal way, please. Councillor Frecknell, in favour? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that is carried. Uh, item 11, motions on notice. There aren't any on notice this month. Item. 12, uh, a slight change in some ways, because there was an original urgent key decision taken by uh, the leader over sports leisure management. 
Uh, so now this is actually uh, for noting because the situation has changed slightly. Councillor Williamson, would you like to bring us up to date? Yes, thank you very much indeed, uh, Chairman. Uh, well, as you'll see from the papers, the recommendation asked Council to note that an urgent key decision was taken by the leader with the consent of the Chairman of our Overview and Scrutiny Committee to provide a loan to SLM. This was to support, to, to support them with the reopening of our leisure centres following the announcement from government that leisure centres could reopen subject to COVID secure measures. Our constitution requires that any decision outside the budget and policy framework which is taken under these circumstances should be reported to the next meeting of the council, hence being on tonight's agenda. However, I can report to members that since reopening, SLM have applied for the COVID business support loan, which has enabled them to stabilize their cash flow and therefore they have not and will not be taking up the loan from the council. Uh, there is a recommendation A on page 145, which is for noting. I'm happy to move if, I need, if it needs to be moved. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I don't think it does because it, it is just uh, for noting on, on this occasion. So thank you very much for, for that update. Councillor Goldspring, did you want to comment? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, well, thank you very much for that update. Um, and yes, and well, I'd really like to ask a question. Um, the procedure is that if such a thing, decision has to be taken, um, that it should be reported back to the next full meeting of the council. Would it be possible to change that so that if such a decision is taken in the future, it could be reported earlier to members, maybe by means of their members information bulletin each week? Because this, this decision was taken in August and that's a long time ago. And if it was still to be necessary, I think that is a big gap. And I think it would be much more democratic if members could be informed much earlier. So would it be possible to change the system? Thank you. Councillor Williamson, do you want to respond to that? You're muted at the moment. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I'd have to go back and check. I, I thought actually that there had been some notification to members uh, at the time, um, but I, I stand to be corrected. Um, but nonetheless, I, I, I take the suggestion. Uh, I can't see any reason why there shouldn't be some notification. Could be through MIB. Right, thank you. Uh, Rebecca, did you want to come in here, Rebecca Dobson? Chairman, yes, uh, Councillor William Williamson is, is right. Um, the uh, decision was published um, to all members at the time it was taken, and of course it can be republicised via the Members Information Bulletin, um, but in the proper procedural way it was publicised when taken, and the requirement is simply to then um, bring a report to the Council meeting following the taking of an urgent key decision in that way. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and that almost concludes that actually with Rebecca making an appearance, we say farewell to Rebecca Dobson because she'll be leaving us. She's going sort of to the sticks, really, South Cambridgeshire. I mean, not much happens there. So, you know. at, at least Alison, who left us from legal affairs, went to Barking in Dagenham. I mean, that would be much more exciting. But uh, we wish you well and thank you for all your support, certainly to me as chairman, but I'm sure to the various councillors uh, during the course of the last uh, year or two. So thank you very much indeed. And you're getting a round of applause, uh, a Zoom round of applause coming your way. So all the very best in your new job. Thank uh, you. I will, sorry, somebody, I thought somebody said, oh, go on, Rebecca, go on, say something. No, I was just thanking you, Chairman, thank you. And thank you to all members, thank you. No, not, not at all. Excellent valedictory speech. <laughs> and, um, can I just mention that the, the next full council meeting is on December the 16th, which is the council meeting that leads up uh, to Christmas. And um, we normally, and I don't see why we can't do this, uh, wear Christmas jumpers or winter jumpers or, or Christmas ties or whatever leading up to Christmas. Um, it'll be a bit difficult for Councillor Bob Deering to wear his Christmas trousers because I don't think that'll work on Zoom. So sorry, Bob, you'll have to probably uh, think again. Um, but in a way, it's quite important because normally the, we ask for a pound to be donated uh, to the Chairman's charity. 
And um, you'll know that many charities are suffering uh, and they have done over the last few months because they've not been able to fundraise properly. Um, so we will hear from one of my charities, Isabel Hospice, on that particular night. And if we could give a donation each, say at least of five pounds, um, that would be great. And we'll get an email sent to you about how you can do that. And it will just help in a very small way because the work that Isabel Hospice and indeed other major charities do, that just continues whether they bring in money or not. So if we can help them out a little bit on that particular night, that would be great. But that concludes our meeting at 8.38. Thank you very much. Keep well, stay safe.